Good evening, everybody. Um, may I welcome you all uh, very much to this um, annual lecture, but first of all, thank you very much indeed for your perseverance. Um, we've been in something of a capsule here, aware of the problems, but um, trying desperately to fix them. Um, the problem has been with Eventbrite, um, going down. So I do apologize, um, but we're back on track um, and we're going to aim to keep to a finish time um, as planned. So I'd now like to formally begin and welcome you all to the annual lecture hosted by the Media School at London College of Communication, part of the University of the Arts London. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event and to welcome our speaker, Professor Joseph Turu. Before I introduce Joe, I'll say a few words about the event. Um, I'll be chairing, and my name is Jonathan Hardy, Professor of Communications and Media. <clears throat> I joined the Media School here in 2020. Um, may I have the next slide, please? And it's been a real pleasure and certainly a very enlightening experience to do so because I've joined a thriving department with um, programs running across media, advertising, public relations, and so on, with, I think, some really innovative um, teaching and research. And that's partly reflected in some of the research centres uh, in the media school. So a long-standing centre investigating photography and the archive, um, centres on creative industries management, digital cultures, and my own that I lead on branded content, the Branded Content Research Hub. So if I may, um, I'd like to claim this talk as contributing to the work of that um, research hub and network, because certainly both Joseph Turo and my work is very much at the um, intersection of media and marketing communications. And I've left my email address at the bottom of that um, for those of you who come to hear Professor Turo today and are interested in this broader work, please do get in touch. Um, join our mailing list and I'll keep you informed about um, future events as we go. But as I say, um, I can't entirely claim the event for the hub because um, Joe Turu has kindly accepted the invitation to join what's been a really important moment uh, for the media school, the annual lecture, with a series of um, guest speakers um, to, to which tonight's event, um, I hope, will add. So I'd like to just say a few words about um, arrangements for the event. Um, Joe's going to speak for around 40 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. And as I'll explain again, you'll be able to put those um, in writing into the Q&A section um, of your screen of Zoom and we'll take as many of those as we can. I'd particularly like to welcome an international audience this evening. So you're joining us across different time zones, but despite our delayed start, um, we're still aiming to finish round about um, 7.30 UK time, uh, round about 90 minutes from our start time. And our audience today includes students and staff from London College of Communication and from across the University of the Arts London, including postgraduate students who've just joined us in the last few weeks, who I'd particularly like to welcome. We have students and academic staff from across the UK and indeed across the globe joining us tonight. And we have some guests from media and marketing industries, as well as from civil society. So representing at least some of the wider range of stakeholders um, who need to be heard in the debate that Joe's work opens up about the harvesting of data from our bodies for marketing. Tonight's event is being recorded and a video will be published on the Media School pages. And please note that if it's helpful to you, there's a transcript facility uh, on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. So there will be a written transcript um, to accompany the talk. So I'd now like to, um, next slide please, introduce our speaker, Joseph Turu. He's the Robert Louis Cheon Professor of Media Systems and Industries at um, the Annenberg um, School of Communications, part of the University of Pennsylvania. He's an elected fellow of the International Communication Association, kind of top um, network for media academics. And he's also been given a Distinguished Scholar Award 
by the US uh, version of that wider network, the National Communication Association. He's authored 12 books, edited five, and written more than 160 articles on mass media industries. In fact, one of the first of his books that I encountered was published in 1997 with the title, Media Systems in Society, Understanding Industries, Strategies and Power. And that has certainly been the focus and task for much of his work ever since. He's examined the media and marketing communications industries and given special attention to their qualities as industries. And he and I are both old enough to have taught classes in the 20th century. Um, so I'd like to share that I would present media studies students beginning undergraduate courses in media with his definition of mass communication which is the industrialized production and multiple distribution of messages through technological devices. As well as examining industries, Joe himself has been incredibly industrious. He's produced a series of deeply researched original studies of media and advertising that have advanced knowledge across the whole field of communications. Alongside a textbook, Media Today, first published in 1999 and now in its seventh edition. A key theme in his work, including his most recent book that he'll be speaking about today, has been to ask us to consider the implications for social cohesion and social justice on the one hand and social inequality on the other, arising from the way the combination of our media and marketing systems and social systems shape who is valued and who is devalued, who is a target for marketers and who is waste in marketers jargon, where the wealth of advertising is spent and what kind of communication services result from the uneven distribution of advertising finance. He's examined these issues through a series of books whose titles will help you see common threads um, such as from 1997, Breaking Up America, Advertising and the New Media World. And then in 2006, Niche Envy, Marketing Discrimination in the Digital Age. Then in 2011, The Daily You, How the New Advertising Industry is Defining Your Identity and Your World. Certainly for me, that book, The Daily You, has been hugely influential because it examined the dynamics and consequences of marketers shifting from putting their advertisements into newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, cinema, and so on, to placing their advertisements directly in front of consumers on their computers and mobile devices by using the new tools of data tracking, profiling, targeting, and delivery of ads. Joe Turu interviews marketers in that book who say, we never wanted to pay the huge subsidy to media companies in order to serve our ads to target consumers, and now we don't have to. Then he wrote The Isles Have Eyes, how retailers track your shopping, strip your privacy and define your power, published in 2017. And that book takes us even closer to his latest book that he will be discussing tonight, published this year by Yale University Press and called The Voice Catchers, how marketers listen in to exploit your emotions, your privacy and your wallet. So it's my real pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight, Joseph Turu. Jonathan, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased that you used my definition of mass communication. <laughs> we should talk about that. Uh, but I am going to be talking today about some areas of my new book, uh, The Voice Catchers, and the title uh, called Voice Prints, Bioprofiling, and the Future of Freedom, the Rise of the Voice Intelligence Industry. I'll talk for about uh, 40, 45 minutes, and then hopefully we can open it up to uh, questions, comments, that kind of thing. But first, I want to give an overarching sense of what I'd like to be discussing. So the theme. Theme is marketing and shopping, the most widely shared public spheres are entering a biometric age powered by artificial intelligence 
and the analysis of individuals' voices to exploit their identities, emotions, and even physical well-being mark its leading edge. This mining of voices, voices through smartphones, smart speakers, car information systems, customer service calls, and other tools signals a new era of discrimination and social typing, where analysts can use actual bodily processes as data for commerce, politics, and governance. Intrinsic to the process are recurring institutional dynamics, including, and I'll talk about this stuff, the never-ending cycle of personalization, seductive surveillance, and habituation. The hyper-personalized understanding of individuals provides them, marketers, with differential, well, people, with differential opportunities and social typing based on profiles driven by machine learning and predictive analytics. Machine learning inevitably introduces biases that associate with those sensitive elements of people's profiles. So at a time when the voice-based world of biometrics is still being built, we need to promote perspectives and policies to derail it, I would argue, before socially corrosive processes linked to it emerge as too entrenched to change. So that's the overarching theme that I'd like to present uh, this evening. And I want to start, and this is US-based, I hope you understand, though I think you'll find resonances what goes on in the UK and the larger EU. Um, we can talk about similarities and differences. But you may have gone to a number where you're calling a marketer. Uh, in the US, we call them 800 numbers. And here's the following. It'll say, this call may be recorded for training and quality control purposes. Uh, lately, I've been hearing them say also for analysis purposes. It turns out that when you do that, there's a good chance that the contact center that you're calling is doing some interesting stuff with your voice. Contact centers are the major areas where voice profiling is taking place today. They link your vocal cords and your syntax, the, the sort of way in which you speak, the specific order of your words sometimes, to reveal your supposed emotional state. And then, they triage you to an agent who's supposed to be good at dealing with either angry people or logical people or friendly people, sometimes based on what they hear in real time, sometimes based on what the computers store about a previous visit that you had with them, with the idea that an agent who's specifically good with those kinds of people, with those sorts of voices and emotions, can make you feel better and even upsell you. Uh, get you to spend more money on the company's products. But it's not just call centers that we're talking about here. Devices such as smart speakers and smartphones are now capturing both our words and the timber of our voices. So for example, Rohit Prasad, who's Amazon's chief Alexa scientist, uh, Alexa being the, the voice of the Echo, Amazon's smart speaker, told the online technology publication 1-0 that, quote, when she recognizes you're frustrated with her, Alexa can now try to adjust, just like you or I do. And you notice that already they're humanizing Alexa. And people who own these devices often humanize them. I was doing some work a couple of years ago, now it turns out, with uh, uh, the Pew Research Center. They were starting to do some work on smart speakers. And I was helping them formulate some of the questions. And I got them to ask a question they thought was kind of weird, but I thought it was interesting. Do you say please to your smart speaker? It turns out half of Americans say please to Alexa, for example, or the Google Assistant, which is an interesting insight into the norms that people have about talking to computers, perhaps, or at least computers that are seductive in making them seem even human. Soon, companies, aside from looking at emotions, may draw conclusions about your weight, your height, your age, your ethnicity, and more, all characteristics that some scientists believe are revealed by the human voice. Um, I did a fair amount of looking into this. Uh, it turns out that the um, uh, research on voice and voice as a portal to the rest of your body has been going on for about 100 years. And in the 21st century, scientists are using artificial intelligence and other kinds of ways to try to figure out what the voice says about you. 
Uh, in particular, I was speaking to a woman who wrote a very interesting science book on voice and uh, the inferences one can make from voice. Um, and uh, her name is uh, Rita Singh. She's at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, one of the things she points out, aside from these physical characteristics like weight, height, age, ethnicity, supposedly you can tell that a woman has been on birth control for about a month by listening to her voice. So there are a lot of very intimate aspects of people that companies uh, and scientists believe can be revealed through your voice. Ironically, Rita and other people studying this area feel that emotions is probably the least predictive. Uh, you can certainly feel the frequencies of a voice change based on your emotions, but the way we pin an emotion onto that, uh, a lot of people who study this seriously say is uh, quite um, culturally biased and not at all as predictive as say height, weight, even ethnicity. So there are very interesting problems here and marketers ironically have chosen at least in the beginning to go with the, the least predictive though they think that it's very predictive. Now, a new industry is emerging around contact centers and beyond that has the potential to change marketing and society in the US and elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, I really didn't find a name for that industry. It's so odd. This is just emerging. The people in the contact center are below most people's uh, radar. And so I've sort of named it. I call it the voice intelligence industry. Intelligence meaning uh, what companies know about us, spying as you were, as it were. It means interrogating your voice to learn things that you may not want to say or may not even know. True or not, many marketers see voice profiling as part of their future. And I spoke to many marketers who actually believe that within five to 10 years, they're gonna be involved in this business for reasons that I will suggest. Uh, it's just beginning right now. Uh, and some companies, even Amazon and Google are wary of getting into it too uh, strongly because they're worried about social concerns, but they feel that down the line, uh, it will become part of our lives. So what's driving marketers' use of voice profiles? Sorry, this Jeff. is a, a statue of John Wanamaker. John Wanamaker, it says citizen. And Sorry, this is Jeff. in front of Philadelphia City Hall. Uh, John Wanamaker was a premier retailer of the early 20th century in the United States. And he had a dilemma, which actually some people, it's, it may be apocryphal, that related to Wanamaker. Some people actually connected to Lord Leverium. And his dilemma was, uh, is, uh, I know that 50% of my advertising works, but I don't know which 50%. And I would argue that you could chart the history of advertising through the 20, 20th century into the 21st century as having to do with an obsession to somehow confronting and solving John Wanamaker's dilemma. Uh, and in, in fact, you could argue that in around 1994, when the commercial internet uh, emerged with uh, browsers like uh, Mosaic, um, the marketers began to see this as possibly the internet as a holy grail to solve it. That somehow uh, the notion that you could see a person clicking and watch the person buying and relate that to the ad that that person just saw, that would in so many ways eliminate the problems that John Wanamaker. So you have this uh, John Wanamaker dilemma <laughs> and uh, a feeling that somehow the internet was going to solve that problem. But, um, and, and marketers ideal goal for the internet was personalized messages and track responses, right? Uh, the notion of, of the, 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 the whole goal of the internet from a marketing standpoint was now we can look at any individual person, we can personalize messages to that person, and we can track their responses. We can go into the particulars of how that has been happening. But looking back in the last 15 years or so or more, it, it turns out it didn't work as they hoped because of things like ad blocking, computer sharing. I can share a computer with my son and it's, begin, it's hard to tell who's who. Click fraud, which I, I think you all know what it is, and other problems. 
like and and not only that you have nowadays the deprecation of the third party cookie by google google has announced that it's for lots of reasons we can discuss it's going to get rid of the third party cookie in its browser chrome which is driving a lot of advertisers crazy they're trying to find out alternatives apple for a lot of reasons we can discuss has begun to require an opt-in for its mobile advertising id which drove facebook crazy because they feel that people are going to say no i don't want you tracking me across different apps and it turns out they're probably right though uh, maybe 40 percent still are so we see marketers following what might be called the unending spiral of personalization. That's supposed to be the spiral. You know? Using voice biometrics for value added purposes. People in marketing I spoke to said, it's not gonna, they're not gonna get rid of demographics online or, or, or even behavior um, psychographics, but biometrics with voice will be used as a value added for the understanding of people. And I call this the spiral of personalization because I believe that it is a new dynamic that we are going to see moving forward. I believe that the spiral of personalization is the guiding spirit behind the new marketing order. Marketers believe that in order to remain competitive, they must gather as much data as possible about current and prospective customers and send them individualized messages and product offerings. Yet because of the very nature of this work, marketers never feel they're doing enough to know their targets and reach them efficiently. They'll always be looking ahead to technologies like voice intelligence that promise new forms of information made possible by greater intrusion into people's lives. That is, today's new technology will soon often fail to satisfy the drive to uncover deeper knowledge of the customer leading to the next innovation. So now we have on the cusp of voice intelligence increasingly, and when that's insufficient to even more intrusive technologies. Clearly we're dealing with facial recognition, but even more than that, which we can discuss toward the end of my talk. So Amazon and Google are the highest profile forces, forces in voice surveillance today. Um, in fact, they're, they've also gotten into the uh, contact center business, yet they're not using the maximum potential of these tools, evidently because they're worried about inflaming social fears. But if you look at the patents, as I went through dozens of patents, you'll see that they have a strong interest in the future of voice profiling. Now, uh, some companies will say to you, ah, it's just patents. We just make patents and it really isn't indicative of the future. I spoke while I was writing the book with um, three patent lawyers who deal specifically with patents in this part of the industry. And they told me, in fact, that patents typically are used. They may not be used exactly like the patent uh, application says for a couple of reasons. One times change, and the company may veer in slightly different directions. Another is that when you write a patent application, they told me, you're really juggling a couple of very interesting problems. You don't want to tell the competition too much about what you're doing. So you may bring examples that are not quite what you're interested in using the patent for. The other thing is you will both use the patent, write the patent very narrowly uh, so that you can claim specific innovation and use, but also very broadly so that you can sue just about anyone who comes close to it. So the idea of the patent application is very much a sense of where the company and maybe where the industry is going. This is an example of one Amazon patent that it got. And I think it's very much in the direction that Amazon is going. Woman walks into her apartment or home. She says, um, <laughs> Alexa, I'm hungry. And Alexa says, noticing that she has a cold perhaps, would you like a recipe for chicken soup? And so the woman says, no, thank you. She says, no, thanks. Then Alexa says, okay, I can find you something else. By the way, would you like to order cough drops with one hour delivery? And the woman says, that would be awesome. Thanks for asking. 
And Alexa says, no problem. I'll email you an order confirmation, feel better. And you may know that at least in the US, Amazon has a uh, delivery pharmacy. So this would very much fit into their uh, strategy of activity. And if you know people who live in, in Seattle, as I do, an hour delivery on a regular basis is nothing strange. And this is taking place in more and more cities in the US. So, so uh, this is very much a direction that Amazon is heading in. Google has a patent for a very strange monitored home where they say they'll put um, um, uh, microphones around the house and the software will detect the individuals in the home as to where they go, what technologies they're using uh, and their age, uh, gender. And the person who's controlling the monitored home, often the, in the patent they talk about the father, will be tracking the, the people like the kids, figuring out where they are, getting schedules about what they're doing, and eventually will be able to um, monitor and craft what their kids are doing by allowing some technologies on, not allowing other technologies on, depending upon what the monitored home has told that person based on where the voices are in different parts of the home at different times with different devices. It's a very odd patent and the really odd part of it, there's a portion of the patent that says if the two people, the, they're talking about a husband and wife get divorced, both of them can take the software with them to their home. So you can split it and you can monitor the kids in both places. Spotify got last January a listening patent where they say that if you ask Spotify to play music uh, with your voice, that is if you ask it with your voice, it will listen in to figure out your gender, your age, your ethnicity, and other characteristics of you. Uh, in fact, that uh, spark, that patent sparked a whole bit of anger um, among in, in, internationally, among various advocacy organizations who tried to get the CEO of Spotify to disown the patent, which he refused to do. I don't know if you know about Amazon's Halo wristband, which I consider a proof of concept. It's a, uh, a kind of Fitbit device you put on your, on your uh, arm and it, it does some basic health uh, stuff like Fitbit. But among other things, it listens to your voice. So as you walk through the day, it will listen to how you speak to different individuals. And it supposedly will tell you how you sound emotionally to your boss, how you sound to your spouse, to your significant other, how you sound to your friends, um, to your teachers. Uh, it's, it's a um, strange thing, but they never tell you when you sign up, I didn't want to wear it myself. I gave it to my wife and she wore it for about a week and then sort of gave up on the damn thing. But um, what you have to do in the beginning is talk to it. And it supposedly decides how to think about your voice. But Amazon really never explains the training set that it uses to make generalizations about how Halo will tell what your emotions are. My guess is it does it through Alexa meaning it, it has somehow uh, taken the billions and billions of, of uh, words and talk that Alexa gets and come up with some generalizations about emotions that way. It's very difficult to tell what Amazon is doing with voice. Uh, and the same with Google. Um, at a certain point um, I, in my readings, I found that Amazon people told the Washington Post and the New York Times um, that they do not use voice for marketing purposes. So I looked around and I, I couldn't find anything in any of Amazon's documents that said that. So I asked the person I had interviewed in Amazon and um, he said, I don't know the answer to this. I'll connect you with somebody in Washington. He connected me with a lobbyist in Washington who said, I can get you to someone who knows the answer, but you won't be able to write about it. And I said, I'm writing a book. That's not gonna help me. And the person never got back to me. Google says that it will not use the voice print for Nest devices in the home, uh, but it does reserve the right to use your voice print uh, and make generalizations about your voice when you talk to the, 
the uh, Google Assistant, for example, on your phone or your tablet. So a lot of interesting things going on, even at the beginning of this new world. It's all based on the idea that people want to interact by voice, even if they know companies are listening. Companies uh, like Amazon and Google believe, and others I'll talk about, certainly the contact centers, that if, even if they're told that companies are listening, people will uh, interact with voice. This is a, an example of the tone. This is on from an online description of Halo by Amazon. See how you sound to your colleagues. Health is more than physical with tone analysis. Halo can help you communicate more thoughtfully and keep your relationships strong. See, and the idea is once you get this, you'll want to do it. Now, in the case of Halo, Amazon goes into a fair amount of detail saying it does not use your data, will not use your voice. But as I said, this is a proof of concept. And I think down the line, they hope people will allow them to. And people seem to be buying into getting these things. Hundreds of millions of people interact with assistants on the phone. Almost one in four Americans owns a smart speaker in the home. And they're being wooed to do that. Um, I came across the, uh, the, the phrase seductive surveillance in a UK dissertation by a woman named Penelope Trinolo. She was writing about the advent of uh, cell phones and how people were persuaded to get cell phones. Um, but moving the idea beyond that, uh, I use seductive surveillance to, to describe how uh, companies take surveillance technologies and try to essentially seduce people into them while playing down the surveillance. So in the case of uh, smart speakers, for example, you have these seductive voices. Uh, people, as I say, say, please to Alexa. Uh, and Alexa is always female, but you can change some voices for certain purposes. Um, and uh, Google, you can actually change the voice. But they initially start as women. Um, the idea of seduction is also true in terms of the cost. These things are really cheap. And on prime days, for example, you could get a, um, uh, an Amazon Echo for like 15 to $20. And ma many people who own them have them in various parts of the house. And eventually the hope is to turn it into habituation. It becomes very much a habit to say, Alexa, what's the weather? Alexa, play this kind of music for me. Um, I have a granddaughter uh, and her parents have Alexa in various parts of the house. In fact, they can say, Alexa, turn up the, the shades and all the shades will go up or even in one particular room. So this two-year-old was running around the house, Alexa, Alexa, itsy bitsy, meaning play the itsy bitsy spider song. Um, and this has become part of her world. Uh, it won't be so unusual for her to uh, interact with devices and to think that these devices are actually quite friendly. Companies throughout the economy are encouraging. And again, focusing on the US, you may see uh, similarities in the UK. I interviewed people from home construction firms who are literally building these devices into the walls of the houses. So the sense is, particularly they say people want either Amazon or Google, not so much Apple or Samsung. And uh, they, people want to have panels on the, on the walls when they come in where they can set Alexa or set the Google Assistant to do things like raise the shades, like change the, the lights in the home, uh, even the colors of the lights and do other things like that. Hotels are using them. Uh, more and more hotels have Alexa or Google Assistant when you walk into your room. And if you have an account with Amazon or Google, you can actually log into the account and it will know you from the start. It will play the songs you like, play the news you like, the podcast and all of that, say the hotels. These things are also concierges. So when you check out, you could do it through that. When you wanna find out about the area in which the hotel is, you can do it through that. And supposedly when you leave, uh, it will automatically erase the data. Schools are using them. I spoke to one woman who actually has an, uh, an app that allows teachers to use Alexa to teach their, their students. 
And um, uh, so without that, a lot of teachers are using uh, Alexa, for example, to um, teach kids uh, certain things, groups of, of their students. When the teacher is teaching another group, they will use Alexa to teach the alphabet or some other aspect of words um, uh, by itself in a kind of a, a game fashion. But of course, Alexa doesn't take data about the kids, but they certainly take a lot of data about the teachers and where they are. There's also shopper marketing firms that are trying out these devices. Um, I spoke to one guy from Mars uh, Shopper Marketing, which is a company in uh, Minneapolis. And he was doing a deal with a company called Bottle Rocket, kind of an experiment in, uh, in New York City, which is a, um, a liquor store. And what they did is they had 150 bottles of liquor and the decision was to try to use Alexa instead of a clerk. And what they did is they around, arranged it in a semicircle, the various bottles with lights under every bottle, every type of, of whiskey. And they encouraged people from the outside with a sign to go in and to start talking to Alexa. And Alexa, this was Alexa for business. So it, it, you couldn't start asking Alexa, who's the president of the United States or something like that. And then Alexa would get you into a branching discussion, whom you buy the uh, whiskey for, what kind of flavors do you like, that kind of thing. And in the end, it showed you five whiskeys by lighting up the whiskeys with the light underneath. And they contended that it raised the sales of, of whiskey. So uh, Mars went to another client, Estee Lauder, the cosmetics company, and said, why don't we do the same thing in, uh, in department stores? And this way, you know, your clerks, you won't have to hire as many clerks and it will raise your business revenues. And it's really interesting what happened. Uh, Estee Lauder liked the idea, but they were afraid of Amazon because despite Amazon saying, we won't do this, they were afraid that what would happen is people ask questions of Estee Lauder and Amazon would take the, the information, what they asked and even the answers and try to create cosmetics or competitive products against Estee Lauder. And so they, they took the idea, but they ran with a Google Assistant and the Google Home Nest instead of um, uh, the uh, Amazon. And in my research, I found an incredible amount of um, cynicism and worry about Amazon in particular, but also Google, what they were going to do with voice, what they were going to do with the information they gather, even in cars, okay? Uh, a bit off with the voice, but one person whom I was talking to mentioned this, that I believe it was um, Volvo that was talking to Google about using uh, the uh, uh, entertainment system based around uh, Google Nest. And uh, one of the Google people while they were talking said, could we put uh, some sensors in the back seat to know the weight of the people in the back seat, so we'll have an idea of whether they're adults or kids. In other words, they wanted to use the entire car to profile the individuals. So um, the advertisers see all of this and they're beginning to get worried because they have to plan for this idea of a voice first world with limited shelf space in Amazon and Google controlled environment. What they mean by that when they talk about it, where if you type something into a search engine, you get a whole bunch of organic and advertising results, right? But if you say, Alexa, get me some batteries or tell me about batteries. The, the notion is that in the first instance, Amazon will give you its own batteries. And, and if, if it doesn't do that because you bought batteries from Duracell, it may just give you Duracell. They're worried, how do you get Amazon and Google to come up with their names if somebody asks a question? Like get me some uh, spices or get me some uh, cameras. So the, the whole issue becomes among advertisers, how do we figure out, how do we reverse engineer the Echo and the Google Nest? And that's what they're doing. A lot of big companies have these labs where they literally are asking those assistants questions and trying to figure out the logic of the assistants. 
in order to be able to control it. Uh, they also are trying, and this is just beginning to happen, to understand voice. So with the idea that if Amazon and Google don't give them access to the voice print, they have other ways to get to it. Um, so ad agency research becomes, as I just mentioned, how do you become part of the answers? Uh, the apps, meaning if, you're, if you have an app on the Amazon uh, Alexa Echo or the Google Nest, uh, they give the, the companies give the transcripts to the app holders, like the battery company or the tire company, but not the voice print. And companies, of course, would like to have the voice print as well to make their own inferences. So companies are going off on their own with assistants. So Bank of America, for example, has an assistant called Erica. Uh, could have called it Eric. And uh, they are beginning to own the idea that when it comes to marketing, they can use your voice. When I started um, the research, I looked at the Bank of America website and I didn't, surprisingly, even though Erica was out there, I saw nothing about voice. I was surprised. When I got uh, toward the end of the book, I figured I, you know, I better look again. And in fact, the lawyers had stuck into the privacy policy a sentence that, that the Bank of America has the right to use your voice. Okay? And uh, the idea down the line, uh, they may use it for voice profiling. Uh, and as that happens, and as companies begin to give firms like the Bank of America and others, Pandora uh, has the right, it says, to use your voice. As they begin to give them the ability to do voice profiling, Google and Amazon may use that to justify jumpstarting their own profiling activities. Okay, saying, gee, the rest of the world is doing it. We can do it too, if they hadn't done it already. So why should we care? Okay, that is the burning question. So I'm glad that I can show you my slides. <laughs> um, businesses using this voice technology to offer us better pricing sounds great. So for example, if you're on the uh, happy end of getting a better discount because you sound like a smarter person, a happier person, a person who might uh, use that particular product for whichever way they infer things of that voice, that sounds great, unless you're in the camp that loses the discount. What if you end up being refused insurance or having to pay much more for it? What if you find yourself turned away during early job screenings because of the way you sound or the way they think you are? Or have your cultural taste prejudged as you surf the internet? Uh, there's also potential for voice scraping. I don't know if you know of places like um, Clubhouse, where you can go in and uh, in, get involved in discussions. They're actually pretty interesting. Uh, a little like um, uh, places like the social media places where people speak. But the potential there, because your name is connected to your voice, or at least some kind of ID, potential for scraping your voice by malefactors and using it for ways that uh, you might not be happy with. And voice profiling is at the front of a gamut of biometric technologies that marketers and other institutions in society will use for surveillance and control. I mean, think of the possibility of using your voice for political campaigns, trying either on the fly to understand what you sound like, what your accent is, where you seem to come from, maybe your gender, your ethnicity, and then changing the ad based upon that. In the US, they have voter profiles that different states have, and they're pretty well open to any political candidates, voter files. And it would be strange to think, and maybe it's quite possible, that a voice print or the or the effects of a voice print, the, the readouts of a voice print could become a part of the voter file. Governments can use it, particularly for the police and the military. Think about an authoritarian country where you're in a, a courtroom and it's not just what you say, but what your voice says you say about you when you're speaking. Um, it's, it's not surprising that the word is out, for example, with the Uyghurs, that they are not tracked only by in, in Zhejiang, China, 
by the uh, uh, features of their faces, but also by the sound of their voice. So th this can be quite scary. What starts in marketing or gets advanced in marketing often doesn't stay in marketing. And we have to understand this as a, a huge social issue. But, but it's still marketing, I would argue, is a really important part even unto itself for society. People see themselves as shoppers. That's what we do in the West. We shop. And uh, the way we see ourselves, the status that we see ourselves within society is very important. The discrimination that takes place based upon uh, various aspects of personalization is something that really can be very prejudicial and affect the way people think about themselves and their society. And this is where I get to what I call the hidden curriculum, which is, it's not just what we see and what we hear and how we interact with Alexa, but the message underlying all of our conversations with these voice devices. And as we move forward increasingly, um, when they profile us, is that voice profiling is the future. That's just it. You have to accept it. And to the extent that that is what people are learning through all of this, this will become, I argue, a really big problem. And it's, it's, uh, it's something that marketers often will, will say tough luck about. I, when I wrote my book, The Isles Have Eyes, um, I was on a, a program with um, uh, somebody in San Francisco, a consultant, a political consultant. And we had also uh, come up with some data on a separate national survey that we did showing that people really don't like um, uh, tailored political marketing. They don't want marketing that's tailored to their particular uh, individual uh, backgrounds because they want to know what other people are getting and they want to be treated like the rest of the population from that standpoint. And when I pointed it out, he didn't disagree with the finding. He just said, tough luck. People are just going to have to get used to it. Now, in the US, many states allow opt-in. Uh, I'm sorry, allow opt-out. So companies don't even have to tell you they're doing it. You just do it. And you have to read the privacy policy. Lots of luck, right? Uh, some, like Illinois and California, to some extent, in Texas, now with biometrics, require opt-in. But my argument, and this is the EU too, is that both are a problem. Because in the world of biometrics, the notion is people can't easily know what's going on. It raises the whole issue of how should we think about consent? And I'm referring to an article here by Woody Herzog and Evan Selinger in a law journal. And they're talking about uh, facial recognition and the notion that um, you can't ask people, or you can, but it wouldn't be appropriate, even ethical, to ask people if they consent to facial recognition if you really don't know what the company is going to do with that data. Uh, the company can be pretty vague about this stuff. And even sometimes the company doesn't even know what it's do doing with it or what, what it will do in a few months. Um, similarly, and what I use in the book is an example of uh, uh, in the medical system, uh, there are aspects of consent with uh, biological consent, for example, giving up a part of your body for a transplant that you really don't know what they're going to do with it. And the question is, is it ethical to get consent in that context? So consent is a really tough subject. And my argument is that when it comes to voice profiling um, in the marketing business, and I don't mean uh, understanding voice, I don't mean uh, listening to people and, and answering questions. I mean, the profiling of people by their voice. Uh, natural language processing is, I think, the future. But profiling through voice, it shouldn't be. Uh, because people generally give, uh, can't give consent. I argue in the US, the Federal Trade Commission shouldn't allow it. Um, that voice marketing should be a marketing red line. Because in, in many ways, it's the tip of a spear. Uh, with biometrics. And so thank you for listening. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Um, wonderful and great to see all the slides accompanying your talk. Um, so 
just to open this up to everyone, we don't have the equivalent of a mic we can pass around to allow people to speak, but we do have um, the Q&A function. So please do use that. Um, it automatically identifies you, but if you want to say more about yourself and where you're coming from, um, that would be really welcome. Um, I'm gonna take some questions. We've already got a few in a moment, but if I may, I might just open up with a question or two to you, Joe, while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, and I actually wanted to ask you first a question, which is almost about research methods and yeah. how we go about this. Um, you interview specialists and senior figures in the marketing communications industry, and they open up to you uh, about their work. And then you write books like your latest, which say some of that work should be shut down. So yes. how do you do it? Yeah. Uh, and more broadly, you know, what are some of the lessons and takeaways from your work for other academics engaging with industry? Well, that's an interesting question. First, I apologize for you guys not seeing all of the slides. I hope that the ideas came out anyway. Um, I, it's an interesting question, Jonathan. I have been very fortunate that maybe it's the kind of topics I choose that, I mean, I have had people say they won't talk to me. It's, uh, you know, uh, but but uh, many people do. And um, what I do is I contact them by, uh, by email first. I tell them what I want to do. I don't tell them all of my conclusions, but they, all they have to do is look me up online <laughs> and see what I've written about. Uh, and yet they still talk to me. I, I talk to people maybe 45 minutes to an hour on average. Um, I, you know what I think the, the, the real key is? I, and without, I, I don't want to just, I know what I'm talking about. If you talk to these people and just come in and you say, tell me about how advertising works, they're going to say, you know, what the heck? I don't want to spend my time wasted by, by stuff you can read in advertising age or, or uh, you know, something like that. But if you come in and say, look, I have this, this knowledge, but I want to learn more. Um, I, they have been very kind and often they're top executives. So, um, they, you know, I, I, I don't ask them about particular clients. They don't want to talk about clients. Uh, that's another issue. The other thing is, um, the, um, I have heard by Twitter that one of the people that I've interviewed a couple of times for two different books has been sniped at by people in the advertising industry who get annoyed and they say, why did you talk to this guy? See, but he just said, I think it's important for people to know what's going on. And so, uh, yeah, I've been fortunate that way. And I think sometimes students um, and professors are too wary. Uh, there's not enough good uh, in situ or even depth interview research that goes on because people are afraid to do it. But if you know what you're doing, I think it, and you follow the, the, the field, it, people will talk to you. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm gonna take a question from Tanvi Akaraju, who asks, um, do you think there will be something like search engine optimization going on in these home devices where people fight to be suggested when a question is asked? That's so exactly what's going on. Yeah. That's what I was suggesting. The, the companies are trying to figure out how to do SEO on Alexa, which is kind of hilarious because as I said, this, you, you may have one or two, two slots to put it in. That's exactly what's going on. You're right. Okay, thank you. And um, Angad asked a question you were touching on at the end, which is the kind of um, the drift and spread and reapplication of things that start with marketers into other realms, um, particularly political communication. So um, this question is, is there any chance the governments could use this technology and databases to work together with other countries' governments to grow the global standards of um, mental health and well-being in the utopian society? So actually, um, sorry, I hadn't fully grasped uh, the direction of that well, question. That's going in the other direction. It, yeah. yeah, exactly. Th this well, is I'll about the joint. There are some really interesting things going on with voice in that arena. Um, it's not all bad, uh, and, and, but outside of marketing, there is this sense of trying to understand whether you can use voice to uh, understand 
uh, whether people have sicknesses or not, for example, or whether uh, a person is getting tired in the car. There's a company called Affectiva, which is working with a company called Surance. Surance is the premier uh, sort of black label uh, car company uh, voice, voice um, um, sort of in, enabler in cars. And they look at, per, in the high-end cars, they look at a person's face and they listen to the person's voice. And if that person feel, sounds tired, they will urge that person to stop. There's, uh, there's also health issues. So for example, there's a company in Israel called Vocalis Health, which is involved in looking at prodromes for um, Alzheimer's disease. And they even were doing stuff on trying to track whether you can tell if a person has COVID by their voice. I don't know how well that's done. But so yes, there are places that are looking at Okay, great. I'm going to give you a couple which are kind of linked to sort of teasing out where technology may be going. Um, so um, Agre asks, would you refer, would you see Twitter spaces as a move towards voice profiling? Um, so what innovation is going on with the social media networks, perhaps more broadly? Um, another one linked to that. Um, do you have concerns that companies are listening to us all the time? Um, even if we don't know it, or does this only happen after we activate them? So um, kind of what are some of the trends uh, yeah. in social media platforms? And, and what about that kind of key question that many users yeah. ask about tracking? Well, the way it works with these devices, and I'll tell you what they say that goes on, and I sort of believe this part of it, um, they're always listening. Uh, five, and, but, and so if you talk, they're ready to sort of pick up on it but they supposedly get rid of uh, the data every few seconds. So nothing gets stored until you say, Alexa, and then ask it a question. And then it gets stored and Amazon probably gets your uh, voice print for that purpose, for whatever purposes it uses. Um, there are, you know, there have been uh, controversies about um, the use of certain snippets of data to uh, verify the meaning to help these companies uh, understand what people are saying. So what they do is they take snippets and then they, they actually send those to places in Germany and Africa and Asia where they have groups of people listening to that stuff and trying to see whether in fact, Alexa, for example, understood it correctly. That has led to concerns that people's data are being shared you know, and often it's very small snippets for each person, but still there's a worry about it and companies have been trying to deal with it, not well necessarily in my opinion. Interestingly too, they actually have to send a lot of people who do this work to therapists because they hear such crazy stuff that goes on in people's homes. There's even been violence and sexual abuse and stuff and, and it's gotten pretty scary. So yeah, there's a lot, whole lot of stuff in that arena as well. Okay, um, we've got a couple of questions um, which touch on discrimination, which I know is something you've written and thought a lot about, including, mm -hmm. of course, racial profiling and discrimination. Yeah. That's not quite how they're framed, but I'd like to kind of open up um, that space for you to speak about your work too, but I'll give you these. So um, Dennis Olson, um, thank you for joining us, Dennis, who's a colleague who teaches advertising and marketing at the University of West London. In your experience, does current AI technology sufficiently consider the peculiarities of non-native speakers accurately mm. as part of the syntax and emotional analysis? And another question really just, you know, about implications. What, what, what are the implications of these devices to surveil minorities? Yes, the, the problem of course with language is, a, is an interesting one. Uh, I, my sense is that companies like Amazon, Google and others, uh, and there are many companies that are trying to do natural language processing, have a vested interest in trying to understand different accents and languages, simply because that's how they make money. The more, the more they understand people, the more money they make. Um, whether that ends up through algorithmic bias as harming those people, ironically, is a very interesting question. Because once you begin, you can say that it has nothing to do with a person's race 
or their gender, but a particular sort of slice of understanding based upon the training set that is used can end up being prejudiced as well. Um, discrimination always takes place. The, the word discrimination simply means slicing people up and looking at them, right? What we're interested here though is in prejudicial discrimination. And there's so much evidence that algorithms uh, have the potential and often do uh, discriminate against people. If only charging them different prices, for example, uh, speaking to them in different ways, showing them different products. Uh, we may think that that's nothing because many of us are on the, the winning end of this. But if you need, if you're in a situation where you want to get a $2 discount and somebody else gets it, but you don't because you're not as important uh, or you don't do the kind of shopping that they would give a person to, that's, that's sad. That's a, that's a problem. Thanks, Joe. And I'm just going to, before we move off this to some other areas that are coming up in the discussion, uh, I'm just going to share a couple of questions which express you know real concerns about mm -hmm. being on the receiving end of surveillance uh, one from a trans person um commenting on on their concerns and one really shifting it to if this is going on what what can and should we do about it that is a really important question i you know i used to believe that the answer was in education you know we have to teach people about this we have to make things more transparent. Companies have to tell you what they're doing. That's the whole notion of, of uh, telling them that you're using your voice and as a result, get opt-in permission. And the GDPR is often based on that. The problem with that is that it's too easy for companies to figure out ways to get you to say yes anyway. Uh, for you all know how probably it says okay or learn more. And if you go into learn more in certain contexts, it, you have to do a whole lot of hunting. Um, but but uh, hitting OK may be the easiest way to do it. Um, the the uh, difficulty is in, again, this, uh, this problem of permissions. My concern is that uh, companies can get a certain number of people to say permission to almost anything. Uh, I was saying this laughingly to a guy I know who's a painter today. And I said, you know, down the line, companies can uh, get you to give a vial of urine, maybe. You know, what I said, what if, what if I give you $25 a week, a month, a month, and you send in every week your, a, urine in that, a urine sample? And he said, that would be great. I have no problem with that. And he was laughing a bit, but I, he was also quite serious. Well, what can they learn about me for my urine, he said. Well, it turns out you're going to learn a lot about people from their urine. And uh, marketers would have a ball with people's urine. So uh, this is a very serious issue. We should not minimize it. OK, I've got a question from Neelan, uh, an undergraduate student who asks a question. I'm not going to ask you to fully answer because it's about how, how to work in the marketing communication industry. But what I would like to ask you to say is, how do you advise students? Um, students are navigating this space. Right. And I'm sure you'd agree that they can take solace from the fact that many in the industries you're interviewing share their concerns. Yes. It's not as if there's a simple divide between the critics mm -hmm. in one space and the proponents in another. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that encourages students to think about how they might navigate yeah. Um, this in, in the jobs and, and routes they take. But what, what would be your advice to students? This is a difficult advice? question. It's a difficult question. I was uh, at a meeting last week, I was presenting uh, my book and some issues to the um, Advertising Education Foundation, and uh, actually Advertising Society Quarterly, which is funded by the Advertising Education Foundation in the US. Um, Look, I'm not about to tell people not to go into the advertising industry. I think that that is a um, that's above my pay grade. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I, I, I there's so many ifs. There are so many possibilities. Uh, I, I have to know the person. I have to know what area and all of this. I will say that we sometimes put too much of an onus on newbies or people lower in the totem pole when it comes to uh, supposed advertising ethics. It shouldn't be on the people in those areas to define the ethics of a company. 
it should be on the executives, the people up on top. You will find examples, for example, people in Google and people in Facebook who will band together and, and be angry at something their companies are doing. And that's fairly unusual. Uh, but I, I, I just, it's really hard to say to a person who's making a living, you have to put your job at stake by challenging your boss about this. So the answer is, I don't have an easy answer. And there are some fascinating aspects to advertising. I certainly understand why people want to go into it. Every aspect of the world, I will say, every occupation has its problems. Being a professor is not unsullied ethically also in many cases. So, you know, lawyers get hated for so many reasons. I, I think we have to take things on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm not, my brief is not with the individuals. My brief is with the structure and trying to change the structure so that it becomes more equitable. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm gonna take a question from Eman, and I think there's a few others, but in a sense, they're invitations to flip the argument mm -hmm. and point to positive um, qualities of, of tracking. So we've already had um, a question that asked about, you know, mental health monitoring yeah. and positive intervention surveillance. Uh, Eman asks, do you think this uh, voice marketing could be used to combat crimes and insurgency in the world? And apologies to others, but I know that's a theme yeah. touched on. Well, that's an interesting question. The real issue is, uh, and people say that the same question goes for uh, facial recognition, right? Um, I would be very wary uh, with respect to how it's done. Um, it can be used in ways, presumably, that can be helpful, but, uh, and, you know, it, if, in the wrong hands, it can be a disaster, okay? Uh, in, the, in New York State, for example, they're using voice uh, identification in prisons. So what they do, and the reasoning is useful. Uh, apparently some prisoners, you know, they have a certain number of phone calls they can make every month. And the prisoners uh, have IDs. And so what happens is other prisoners will extort from them their IDs and want to use their phone money as it were. So what the prison people have done is they now listen to the call and try to see whether the voice of the person who punched in the ID is the actual person. Sounds like a great idea, but at the same time, they're also listening to the people who you're calling. And so they sometimes the sense is it's not quite clear whether that's either ethical or constitutional that they're recording the person whom you're calling and identifying them as well as the person who is calling. So things get very confused. It can be, uh, you know, in the name of authoritarianism, it could be called uh, getting rid of crime. You know, go to the Philippines and see how that's happening. Um, and I should say that my book is about marketing. I, there are so many aspects of the world that can be better because of voice. I think natural language processing, not profiling, but the use of voice to talk to devices is the future. I mean, I, I don't think that people typing things in is what it's gonna be like in 10 to 15 years. It's gonna be people talking to machines. And now how do we want to structure society based on that? Do we wanna believe that when we talk to a machine, it's we and the machine, and I would call it it and not say please necessarily, or do we wanna think that there's a sea of understanding under that machine, under our discussion, that somebody is taking those data and using it in ways we have no clue about? Okay, um, to keep to my promise, and I know we started late, we're coming near to 7.30, which is yeah. our, our finish time. So um, let, let me put um, a couple of questions to you. One, just keeping with this, the more sort of positive direction of travel, comes from um, Andrew Cantor, one of our partners, who's the global CEO of the Branded Content Marketing Association, who really asks you to um, identify who's doing well in this space as brands and marketers? Is anyone getting the balance right or, or not? Well, it's so hard to see. The, the company that's the doing really well from a um, uh, revenue standpoint is a company called NICE, N-I-C-E. They uh, do a lot of the work where it comes to contact center businesses. Um, the rest of the world is still fairly small. Con the contact center industry is fairly well established by now. There's a company called Cogito, a company called Verint. Uh, 
And uh, when you go outside of that, it's really just Amazon and Google and uh, Apple that are the, the gorillas. And everybody is trying to figure out how to deal with that world. There are some independents that are trying to figure out, as I say, natural language processing and, and how to help companies create their own apps. And there are some companies that are trying to do profiling like that, but it's still a very nascent business. Okay, Joe, um, I'm going to put two questions to you, and I think this will probably be the last round uh, we can do to, to everyone. But um, the first one comes from Hussein, who is a PhD researcher at the LSE. So welcome and good luck with your PhD, Hussein. Yes. And you ask, um, and by the way, he's one of the speakers who said how much they've enjoyed the talk. I don't think we've fed that you. back to us. I very speakers, much appreciate but, that. But thank you. His question. Um, my question is that is what voice profiling adds to what platforms already know about people? Um, are you more concerned about the difficulty of getting their consent or the increased discriminatory potentials of voice profiling? That so is a it, great question to say. I get that question a lot, particularly the first part of it. The answer is that at this point in time, uh, what companies are doing with voice, you could say, gee, it's emotions. And there are ways to track emotions. Uh, Varent does this through words, not, not listening to the voice, okay? Uh, so it's emotions. And as you seem to be implying, um, ethnicity, age, and other things can be gotten in other ways. So what is this adding? Well, first of all, companies may not have those data and they can get it in real time, supposedly, from your voice. And secondly, we don't know what companies will begin to think about through your voice. It may well be that there are things about what your voice is telling about your body that at this point we have no clue about, but in five years, if we allow this to go on, somebody will come up with things, as I said, diseases, um, the way you, you, uh, you do things in your life. I mean, there may be so many things that we don't know about what a voice tells us uh, that will appear in, in, in time. And if we allow marketers to do this, uh, they're going to be the ones who are projecting those ideas on us and staring into our bodies that way. OK, thank you, Joe. Um, I am conscious. I um, realize some people need to leave us. My apology for straying a little bit past 7.30 is, is a, a, a late start. But I'd like to take a question from my colleague um, here in the media school at L LCC. Um, um, Zoetania Sujan, whose own book, The Social Media Age, came out earlier this year, and she asks, how does the voice intelligent industry fit in with what some have called the social quantification sector, or what Sushana Zubov has called the behavioral futures market? Is voice profiling a driver for these broader markets. So I guess to finish up, and this will be the last question, that's just- oh, It is exactly that. Intersect. Oh, it, yep. it's exactly that. And as I was saying with my clubhouse example, the way of, of using voice in social media to infer things is, is, is so predictable if this is allowed. Uh, the use of other kinds of biometrics, as I say, I think this is a, the beginning of a new understanding of people through their bodies. And once you begin, I, Meta is gonna go do that. They're gonna go that way, I'm sure of it. I mean, think about the way of using um, uh, alternative reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, and trying to infer things about your body through that. I mean, all of this and your voice through, and as part of your body. Yes, I think you're right. All of this is a beginning of a new way of trying to think about us. And I think we have to push back. Thank you, Joe. And I'm so pleased I've just um, shared, there was a question about Meta, so you've at least touched on it. So thank you, Joe, um, not just for your talk, but for your work. Um, thank it, you. It's insightful and disturbing in many ways that so many of the references in your book come from industry and from tech journalism and um, not so much from academia because you're some way ahead of the pack 
in addressing these Very issues. Um, you. So um, th that's important, but I hope people listening to you will be inspired to join and, and share in this really important work. So thank you all so much indeed for joining us virtually on a, on a, a November evening. Thank you very much for coming to this talk. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, thank you all and thank Joe. Thank you very much, people. Take care. <laughs>